before we get into the meat and potatoes of today's conversation, I wanted you to just briefly go over your origin story for those who may have been living under a rock and are unfamiliar with you. How did you, what, what led to the conception of strength camp and how did that evolve into what you're doing today? When I was a kid, like kindergarten, like a child, my uncle who was my mother's brother came and lived with us. And back then he was a martial artist, the black belt in Northern Shaolin Kung Fu. He ran marathons. Then he ended up being a bodybuilder. He was just an all around athletic badass. He grew up in Belize, only family that grew up in Belize. So he grew up like running around barefoot, swinging from vines and stuff. So he just had really good genetics, plus just like very active. And so when he came and lived with us, me and my brother would hang out with him in the basement and he would be doing like backflips and stuff and chopping bricks with his hands. And he would teach us how to like beat up the, the punching bag. And we were doing push-ups and sit-ups when most kids couldn't even tie their freaking shoelaces. So I started training very early on. When I got to high school, I wanted to play football. I wanted to play on the varsity team as a freshman. And so he came, he came back into our lives at that time. You know, he had separated from us for a while. He came back into our lives and that was back in like, that was like 1994. And he was like one of the very first personal trainers ever. Like he decided that, hey, I'm not, I'm not gonna be uh, an accountant anymore. I'm gonna teach people how to work out like I've always done. So he taught me and my brothers how to lift. My dad bought us a barbell in the basement. I started lifting when I was 14. and. Uh, I, I excelled in football as a result, had a football scholarship. And he taught me two things. He taught me that, or showed me that I can make a living teaching people how to get stronger. And I wanted to do that so bad when I saw him do it. And number two, I could work for myself as a result. He was, a, he was the first person I ever saw that didn't have a job. Like, you know, my family, everybody has a job. My uncle Elroy, like, didn't have a job. He, but he was a, he was, because he was a, contractor like he worked for himself in other words yeah. he had clients and stuff so that blew my mind in high school when I was like this is it this is the, my fate was sealed I was like this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life I'm going to teach men how to grow stronger and I'm going to work for myself and so I taught my high, I taught my high school football friends how to lift in the basement I went to college I'll bring over the guys from my college team lifting my basement I was always coaching guys on teaching them how to lift and I parlayed that into my into my career and I started strength camp when I moved down to Florida after my wife and I had our first child uh, out of the back of my van. I was training people with trash in the city parks. I would, I would find used tires and I bought old barbells and I would fill up the van. I would take it out and just dump it all out on the park. And I started training people. This is way before boot camps were even a thing. Uh, I started using YouTube to film the workouts because I wanted the clients to show their friends so that I can get referrals. Well, that snowballed into, you know, over a million people watching my videos because they enjoy what I have to say and do. So here we are. Mm -hmm. And then it, it didn't, it evolved from not just physical development. It started to get into more, uh, you know, men would ask you all types of questions in regards to That's women right. or money and stuff like that. Was that a natural progression? Did you ever, when did that transition switch? And did you feel was there ever a point where you felt that it was um, like you were unqualified to speak about those things or you felt like you should stay in your lane? Does that make sense? Did you? Was so this... when the kids would come to my gym and I would train them, right? When it, if anybody's ever worked with young men and you gain their trust because you help them get results. I mean, these kids were getting bigger, they were getting stronger and they would hang out in my gym afterwards and they would ask me questions. Hey, Elliot, what do you think about this thing with my girlfriend? Hey, Elliot, what do you think about this thing with my parents? Hey, what do you think about this thing with school and my career? So they would stick around and it was all, it almost became like a, like a men's group where we would lift, but then afterwards we just sit around and we would talk. And apparently they enjoyed my advice. I was like a big brother to a lot of them, you know? Yeah. And I saw the same thing happening on YouTube. It was crazy. I'm just making videos when I'm lifting. I'm teaching me how to lift. But then in the comments and in the questions that were coming, my DMs were always related to all aspects of being a man. One thing that I'm blessed to have in my life is an alpha male father. I had a strong father, a good father, a real good masculine role model in my life. And he was also very vocal. And so he would preach to me, 
and my brother is all day long, all the time. And so it was kind of like in my DNA and also <clears throat> based on my experience and also because of the gift that I have, which most men these days do not have, which is that of a solid patriarch at home. And so I knew in a way that I was kind of standing in that role for a whole generation of young men on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people who are in a position similar to yours. That's why people like Jordan Peterson have gotten so popular as many men do not have that role model. So as soon as someone steps into that role, it's like, wow, finally, someone's talking about these issues that I am either shunned from discussing, I'm not allowed to discuss them, or people look bad on me, look uh, poorly on me for even wanting to talk about those things. I think in general, masculine development is looked down upon in our culture. So someone like you, oh, yeah. someone like you comes under uh, quite a bit of criticism and controversy for sharing a lot of these ideas. And it, it's cool that you had a an alpha father who instilled confidence in you to to be verbal to speak the truth to not be afraid of saying what you want to say um in today's soft culture everyone is labeled as a misogynist racist bigot you know the cancel culture vultures looking for their next meal <laughs> what it what advice would you give men on honing their confidence and speaking the truth in a world that hates truth <laughs> what did they say that tr truth is treason in an empire of lies yeah. and we are living in an empire of lies and i'd say before even look we need to speak up but we need to wake up first and through the disneyfication of our culture through the pop music movies school we have been brainwashed into a gynocentric feminist feminized effeminate world for for men but women it's the flip it's the flop we're we live in such a perverted culture that women behave think and act and and strive more like men and men on the flip side think behave and act more like women and you know there are various there are, there are various uh sayings or ways that we're we're kind of like encouraged to be more like women and discourage from being more like men. One, for example, is this whole idea that men need to be more vulnerable, right? This sounds good and I used to subscribe to that. I'm like, oh yeah, that's great, vulnerable. But it doesn't make for intersexual dynamics because women are naturally vulnerable just by nature of having a gash in their body that could be invaded. They're vulnerable, right? And they're weaker, they're smaller. It is of a woman's nature to be vulnerable. She can't help it. Why then? Do you take teach the stronger sex that's designed to protect, provide, and care for this vulnerable little creature to be vulnerable? Why? And then on the other side, they teach women to be strong and independent, but it's not in their nature and it's not in our nature. Why don't we just honor our natures and allow it to be what it is? But in this diabolically disoriented world, everything women are turned against men. So some people who say stuff like this, that is just basic, basic stuff are seen as like you say, misogynistic. Mm -hmm. Speaking up is just speaking the truth, right? I'm not making anything up. I'm talking about what things have been like for thousands of years. We've only become so smart now that everything's backwards and nothing's working. Just look around the world. If you, if you think that the, the general consensus on how men and women should behave based on this, uh, modernist, postmodernist mindset is righteous, then why aren't families working? Why aren't marriages working? Why are men going their own way? Why are women dying of rotten eggs on the inside, never having any babies? What's going on here? Why are we struggling to such a great degree? Because it's all based on lies. None of it's true. We need to go back to, ge to, to traditional gender roles because that's what works. That's what we are. And we've known that we've known that for thousands and thousands of years, but there's this inversion to the point where legitimately, if you speak on something that's been ancient wisdom, we've all known this, you don't need to, there's nothing controversial about saying 
there shouldn't be anything controversial about saying men and women are different, but it's to the point that right. if you want to talk about these things and, and most people, I don't know. Cause a lot of people are blue pill conditioned where they, they think in this feminist, uh, this gynocentric social order, and they have been brainwashed by Disney movies and all this shit. But I think that people sub on a subconscious level know that these things are true. And when they hear them, it, right. it actually offends, it offends them because it shakes up their, uh, what would you call it? Their ego investments. And uh, yeah. one thing, one thing I wanted to ask you this next question, which I was hoping would be the meat and potatoes of today's conversation was, um, it has to do with red pill awareness in regards to intersexual dynamics. I know you've had Rolo Tomasi on your show. I'm a big fan of his work. I've read all his books and I've, I've been in that, in, in that content for a while. Uh, many of the red pill gurus, if you want to call them that tend to be anti-marriage. They tend to be, I've, I've not all of them, but I've noticed some of them are very, you know, MGTOW men going their own way. There's a, there's a push to be to be against monogamy, against commitment to one woman, even nihilistic and black, a black pilled outlook on monogamy and marriage and family. But how do we as men integrate red pill awareness into a moral slash spiritual framework? It's so funny because the red pill brought me back to the Bible. Literally the red I, pill yeah. made me Christian again. Because then I started reading the Bible and I'm like, wait a second, these are all timeless truths spelled out in an 8,000 year old book. I'm talking about the Old Testament. What is it? 6,000, 8,000 years, thousands of years old. And so everything that the red pill community is kind of throwing out there uh, is a rehash of what we've known in our patriarchal society since the beginning. It's always yeah. been this way. It, it, in, in Christianized West, right, which was once Christendom, but according to Antonio Gramsci, who is one of the founders of, of uh, cultural Marxism, the only way that you were going to destroy the West, take down the people and so make them all subject to this new world order is to de-Christianize the West. You got to get rid of religion. So all this enlightenment thinking, you know, has, has in essence, put us into a dark age, really, because we are no longer carrying ourselves, thinking of ourselves and behaving in noble, dignified, divine ways that religion has forever showed us that right way. We're too smart for that, apparently. So another question I have for you is, in the West, all the odds are stacked against us when it comes to marriage and family and stuff like that. Oh yeah. You know, yeah, the institutions that are against us, absolutely 100%. They've been set up to destroy the family. How you destroy the family, you allow a number of there's a number of steps to destroying the family. Number one of which is contraception. Contraception then opens up this room for sterile transient sex. And when sterile transient sex becomes the norm, then relationships between men and women start to erode. So we got that, we got divorce culture, we got a abortion culture. And then we have, uh, like you were bringing up, how the institutions are 100% pit against the man. So mm -hmm. there's no, for guys that want to get married, I feel bad. I don't, I don't know. I've been married for 20, my anniversary was this week. I've been married for 29 years. I have a great, I have a great marriage. I wish everybody could have the same thing, but my wife and I abide by traditional gender roles and she does things that most women won't want to do. And I do things most men don't want to do. Most men want to behave like women. And I'll tell you this hookup culture for men, promiscuity for men is behaving like a woman. Because if you're out there indulging in sensual activity, entertaining yourself with titties and, and twats, you're basically in a, you're a, you're an addicted lover who's out there just living your life for pleasure with, and pleasure with no responsibility is like candy that will rot in your teeth. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. We're out there. We're destroying our souls by having all the sex with absolutely zero responsibility. It's unnatural. It's not natural. These guys who want to say, oh, it's not natural for us to be polygamous. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go with you on that one. But stop wearing condoms, stop using contraception, yeah. blow your load every time you have sex and see how that works out for you. It won't. You'll be much more conservative about where you put your dick. 
we're wired to spread our seed far and wide, but we never had the technology of contraception. So if you had sex with a woman, she got pregnant, boom, you got to take care of those kids. You had sex with this woman over here that she got pregnant, boom, you got to take care of those kids. And for most men, that wasn't doable. They didn't have the resources or the power to take care of that many children. So we don't even know the true, well, we we're starting to know now, we don't know the consequences <laughs> of the, the sexual revolution or the sexual liberation, whatever you want to call it. And uh, this is actually a good, good time to bring up a book you've been talking about. Uh, it, it was called Libido Dumandi. How, how do you pronounce it? Dumanandi. Dumanandi. Yep. Yeah. Sexual domination. Yeah. And I haven't read By, the book. Uh, e. Michael Jones. Yeah, I haven't read the book, but I, I looked up the author and I went through a lot of the content. And from what I gathered, it's all about how sexual liberation is actual, actually sexual slavery and political control. And yes. it, while, I was re while I was going through that information, it made me think about, I don't know if you've read Aldous Huxley's book, uh, Brave New World. Have you read that book? No. No. Well, it's, it, goes no. Into, it goes into a lot of... Um, uh, the idea of pleasure being the the uh, force through which authoritarians, it's the force they use to keep control of the population. So people are shackled by pleasure, instant gratification. Yes. And that's what's happening today. And even um, uh, people will talk about, you know, this COVID situation as being similar to George Orwell's 1984, which is a fear-based which is a fear-based control. Right. Yeah, but actually, I think our culture is more in the into the brave new world realm because you have men at home jerking off to 4K pornography. They're watching their Netflix. They're comfy. They're cozy. Creature comforts. Everything's. They they don't mind staying home. The government's paying their wage, and they're they've got right all types of instant gratification to keep them going. And that's why that's where I think we are as a culture. So that that book uh the one that you were talking about really kind of like encapsulated all those ideas um do you want to go yeah. into explain a little bit what your thoughts are on sexual liberal liberation and how it's actually used more as a way of controlling people well you could even see it in the garden with adam and eve that creation story is jam-packed with all kinds of little nuances that help us understand intersexual dynamics and one of the things that happens there is, of course, Adam is charged with protecting the garden and his wife. That's his only job. But of course, he fumbles. Your only job is to protect this. But rather than correcting his wife, talking to his wife, or making the right decision, when his wife is tempted, which women are tempted, women are more easily seduced than men. There's no question about it. Men are usually more discerning, usually have stronger boundaries, and more willing to say no than women. And so, of course, the story tells you that, you know, that you need to be aware because women will be susceptible to things that are delightful to them, right? So the, 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 the serpent comes and explains, hey, look, don't you have to listen to your husband. You don't have to listen to his father either. This fruit is beautiful. It's good for you. And you should, and you should eat it. Well, as far as uh, sexual liberation is concerned, Adam decides at some point in the story he's when god asks him uh you know or god is charging him with you know breaking the rule he says i wanted to be with my wife i wanted to do what my wife was doing i didn't want to do the right thing i didn't want to listen to you i wanted to go where i was receiving pleasure and this is where we see men simping they will do all kinds of dumb things and, and make all kinds of retarded mistakes and ignore their common sense logic and that which is right and wrong because what? They wanna be with the woman. They wanna have that sex. They become addicted to her sex. There's so many, there so many guys that I've, add, I've asked this question. They come to me and they're complaining about their wife. They complain about their girlfriend. Man, this girl is a pain in the ass. Oh, I can't handle this girl. And then I ask them, I say, hey, what? Guess what? Stop having sex with her. Stop having sex with her over two weeks and see what happens. And come back to me. And you know what they come back and say? And I ask them, like, so how did it go? They realize she has nothing for me. They, I don't know what I was doing this whole time. 
why was I hanging out with her? Why was I putting up with her crap? Why was I following her lead? And it's because I had sex goggles on, like a crack addict that needs that fix. Mm -hmm. They're much more susceptible to following the lead of the woman who is being led by the serpent. Just like Adam, he wanted to, he wanted to maintain that, 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 that good stuff between her legs. He wanted to keep getting it. <laughs> and so he fell. The story is all about how women want to rule men and how men are effeminate and weak. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So in that same vein, how do we, how do we harness our raw sexual energy as men? in a productive manner that's going to be productive that's going to lead to productive outcomes in our lives and in in a society as a whole like how do we we're wired to be um you know sexually promiscuous as men or we're, we're wired to spread our seed far and wide how do we have sex how the fuck do we channel that because that's a, especially in this world i'm when I was 14, I had access to porn. Hell, when I was 12, I had access to porn. So I had that, you know, I didn't know how damaging that was. When I was young, it was like, oh, wow, this is awesome. And then as you get older, you realize, fuck, man, like, what's this doing to me? What's, how is this wiring me to the point where I'm now 28 and I'm in a monogamous relationship right now? And, you know, I still have that struggle where, and I'm sure tons of men are have that temptation to be like, fuck this, I'm going to, you know, just keep living that life and keep hooking up with a ton of chicks. But how do we reject that? And, you know, we can't just, we can't just repress that energy because that's going to make us sick. But how do we, you know, uh, channel that in a productive manner? Well, first I'll have to say, and, you know, I, I'm not trying to be idealistic here because I understand the challenges of this day, but I have to point out that that's the point of marriage. That's why we got married, so that there would be a safe space, so that there would be a stronghold for both partners to get what they need. And for men, the marriage contract requires, I don't know if people know this, but feminists definitely don't know this, but when a man and a woman is married, they owe each other their bodies. My wife's body is not her body. If I want to have sex, it's her obligation to have sex with me. And in the same light, it's your obligation or my obligation as a man to keep her home, like let her not have to work. Mm -hmm. Now we have women out there working and we have men who are, you know, who are, who are getting uh, denied sex. But the really way it's supposed to be <laughs> is that the responsibility is that you're, the woman deserves, she, her right is to be home to take care of all the babies that pop out because it's the man's right to drop seeds as many times as he wants. So I know that sounds a little strange in our world today where we, you know, we think everything is equal and the same, that we should be behaving like men, like women and women like men. But the fact is that the re a, part, a solid part of the reason why the institution was created was so that we can, get, so we can have a place, a, a, well, I hate the word safe space, but so we're not out there wasting our energy because not only are women wasting your vital resources every time you blow your load, but to be in hookup culture means you're like, you're dating, you got to spend money, you're staying out late. There's, there's, a, there's a whole slippery slope of degeneracy and lifestyle to get involved with out there that you, you're better off not dealing with. It's better to have one place to rest your head, one place to come home to. That's my opinion, but it's also the truth. It's, that's the why we set up this way. But marrying women these days just ain't an option, I understand, for most men. Like, I understand. I get why they won't do it. So there is, there are really good examples, starting with if you wanted to do the research into the monks, how monks live, early Christian monks, monks, Orthodox monks on, on Mount Athos, and even men who have chosen monk lifestyles contemporary monk lifestyles like Nikola Tesla. These are guys who decided that rather than blowing my load, I'm going to use that energy to create something, either prayer, mm -hmm. ecstasy, connection with God the Father, or technology, uh, industrialization, creating art, creating something. Now, 
there's a process. And I just started discovering this myself because I've been practicing semen retention. I couldn't speak with this such, with such confidence until I started practicing semen retention. Otherwise, before this, it was just conceptual to me. Now I see it in action and I could speak to what some tips really help me, right? Like I'm having sex, but I'm not blowing my load in other words. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of benefit that I also yeah, to, I haven't, to stimulating, to sharp, sharpening the ax, but without blowing your load. Mm -hmm. I've, I have- You gonna say something? Yeah, I have uh, practiced semen retention. I have not practiced having sex and not, and not blowing my load. That's something that is a yeah. little bit, that's challenging. What is that, what is that uh, practice called? Carezza sex is what they call it. Mm -hmm. You know, the most contemporary term. And what would you say are the benefits in that? I'm curious. I'm very interested in this. Concept. Well, for young men, where were we going before? I was going to make a point, but I'm going to follow your lead. You're oh, taking yeah. me there. Fair enough. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember. It's one of those days. Um, I will tell you just from my own experience as a 40 year old man, right? Just be transparent. I began to think that I had ED. I was having, typically having sex with my wife three, four times a week. This is what we were doing, right? Our mm -hmm. Sex. Every time I have sex, I blow my load. And after doing some research, I discovered that I was too indulgent in my blowing my load. And that so by retaining the val the vitality grows in the body, your strength grows in your body, your energy grows, your, your, your vitality grows. And so as a result of not blowing my load, I have no, I, I can have a boner anytime I want. I think a lot of guys, especially if you get in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s and beyond, they think that they're, they think they're having ED, but really what they have is limp dick syndrome from blowing their load too much. Mm -hmm. you, you just, just, you're just letting it out too often. You got to store it up so that you're a full man. Mm -hmm. When you're in your twenties, even in your thirties, at least for me, I fill back up real quick, fill back up real quick. But as you get older, it's, it feels a little bit slower. So you don't have the luxury of letting it out all the time. There's a really good book. Actually, I actually have it right here. Listen to your body. And it's about traditional Chinese medicine. And in it, he, he talks uh, about how often you should blow your load. He says, for a man of 20 years old, he should only blow his load once every four days. At 30 years old, once every eight days. 40 years old, once every 16 days. So I'm 40. I shouldn't yeah. be blowing my load any less than two weeks, 16 <laughs> days. At 50, 20 days. And at 60, once a month. Mm -hmm. And so uh, some of the benefits of that, according to traditional Chinese medicine anyway, are heightened senses. Um, oh, I wish I had another quote there. But there's, uh, there's another quote in there where he talks about how first your sight and your hearing get better. I don't know if this is legit or not, but this is the philosophy anyway. You're so, and then you start thinking clearer, then your muscles start toning up, then your posture gets better, then you're breathing deeper and relaxing more. There's just this, it, it goes on to explain that after a certain amount of time of having sex without blowing your load, your, your body becomes more vital. You have more vitality, more vibrance. And so there's a lot of anecdotal evidence to that, but now people have done lots of research. There's this uh, neuro, neuroscientist, on YouTube, he's got a he's got a, a a TED talk where he's talking about the effects of basically essentially the effects of ejaculating, and the effects of ejaculating on the brain are very similar to the explosion of neurotransmitters that one experiences when they take a hit of heroin. And if you know anything about someone who's addicted to heroin, first of all, you're addicted to it, right? So you you don't know yourself when you're an addict, right? Because you're so you're so busy reaching after the thing. But also, there's a lull. There, with every high, there's a low. And there's a low associated with having that neurotransmitter explosion after the orgasm that then changes, changes a number of things, including how the man and woman relate to one another. One of the reasons why people get bored in their relationships is because they're orgasming too much. This comes from a book called uh, um, Cupid's Broken Arrow by the wife of the neurosurgeon. So uh, I forget her name but Cupid's Broken Arrow. And in that book, she was trying to say, her whole point was that she wanted to save relationships. And one of the things, at least, you know, I've been with my wife for, we've been together since we were in high school and like, I, I'm still in love with the woman, but when I'm not blowing my load, I'm much more interested much more of the time. And the same is with her. The woman who, who 
for some, there's something in a woman that craves the seed of a man, not even just, not even the orgasm, not even the, the act, but she literally wants the seed, like she's hungry for it. And so by spacing that out more, there's just more attraction between us. There's more attraction between the partners if there's no climax. When the climax happens, attraction dwindles. And after a certain amount of time, this is why people get bored with each other. They get bored with each other. They get uh, this, this, this um, enchanted with one another because it's like, oh, I fucking I blew my load in you 40 times already. I'm tired of it. But if you maintain your erection and you don't ejaculate, you're still interested and she's still interested. And the, and the pleasure between the two of you, the bonding that happens between the two of you is increased. Also to say that I'm not a fan of contraception and it has, is not even a moral thing, right? Like, you know, as a Catholic, I understand that, it, that it's, it's against the moral code, but I've seen the results and we can, we can very clearly see the results of sterile, tr sterile transient sex. That's another one from E. Michael Jones. And he says, the minute a culture starts using contraception and having ster sterile transient sex, it's a slippery slope to homosexuality. And then what we have today, which is transgenderism. He says, the minute you start turn sex from something that's done within a marriage and that you take responsibility for to entertainment, the, the culture is done. It just, it's a, it's a cascading effect after that point, road to trans kids. And that's where we are right now, because in the 1960s, we made, we turned sex into entertainment with uh, contraception. Now, if you're doing Coreza sex, if you're not blowing your load, you don't have to use contraception because the man is in control. There's so much benefit for men to be in control. I spoke about this in one of my other videos also too. It is not for men to be ecstatic. That's a part of the effeminate culture that has taught us that we need to be all in our feelings and we need to have, you know, these blissful experiences, right? And men are running around chasing fucking blissful experiences and orgasms, so they're so addicted. But it is, it is of a man's true, his, the true expression of masculinity is stoicism, is to be, is to sit, right? If you ever read David Dita's Way yeah, of the Way actually, of the Superior Man. I was man. actually just going to bring that book up. He talks about being in control of the sexual experience. I, it's been a while since I've read the book, but even just being in control of your own orgasm, which a lot of men aren't like I've had, I've struggled with that. And I'm wondering if having sex, but not climaxing could lead to more control while having sex. And I'm assuming it does. Yes. Oh yeah. Practice. You learn a hell of a lot about yourself, which reminds me what, what, where we were going with it because it was about what do we do because we can't control ourselves even when we're not having sex. It's like, we want to blow our load as men, right? Like, I just feel this thing. So if I learned this, that's going to help that first question because I don't remember it and it's, going to, and it's going to support you in your Carissa sex adventure. I don't know if you do this, but I know I do. And when I bring it up, a lot of guys get what I'm talking about. When you get when you get a boner, it's natural. It's normal. I got a boner, right? Like it could come on for no reason. Mm -hmm. But just with as as it is with entertaining negative thoughts or you know taking something to the extreme, when you get that boner, we have a tendency to like the way it feels. And you ever do you ever do like the, the boner pump, where it's like like I you start like contracting your oh, prostate. I, I see what you're saying while you're having sex. No, 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 like right now, like, oh, yeah, like yeah, you yeah. have a boner and then you know, you know how you can make it move, <laughs> right? You know how you can make it move? I think that's what they call a Kegel. Well, I don't know what you call it. I call it a dick pump. But when <laughs> I, when you have a boner and you start doing the dick pump, it's like, it's, it, 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 it pushes you closer to that climax, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, that feels so good to just, and I know when I started observing myself, when I do it, it's a, it's a, it's a drawing up of the pelvic floor and a pumping of the prostate because the orgasm, the physical reaction of, a, of an orgasm is the prostate spasming. That's what it is. It's the prostate doing this. That's why when you, when you, when you blow your load, a lot of times it's like spurts. It's like, yeah, because it prostate's doing this. And so because we know that's where it's going subconsciously, we have a tendency to start like contracting the prostate. And I found that if I, number one, sexual transmutation, taking that sexual energy and turning it into something else means we have to back off of the penis pump. You get a boner, don't mess with your boner. In other words, of course, I'm not saying, I'm saying don't go rub it, but don't start like 
doing this with the legs or start like contracting the pelvis and doing things to like make it feel better or like to push it towards its climax. Cause I don't know about you, but that's what I would do. I have a boner and it's like, oh man, I just want to like press it against my wife and I just want to pro- pump my prostate. If you get a boner and you're just cool about it, right? Let it be dormant because it's just a dormant boner. You follow what I'm saying? You're not putting any energy into it. You're not putting any thought into it. You're just letting it be. Let your boner be and then let your mind drift. Don't think about your boner. Don't think about the prostate. Don't think about the feeling or anything. Take your mind up off of it and redirect your attention to something else. Now, you might not have something to direct your attention that's engaging enough to take it off of your dicks. In that, in that what case, about, what you do is you breathe. Yeah, what about just, just go, putting energy into different parts of your body too during sex so you don't just have to think about your dick the whole time? And I think that's a problem. We get, there's a lot of tension. Like we like, we're holding so much tension, but just fucking breathe. David Dita talks about that in his book. Feel it like up and down your spine. It's not, it's not just all in the genitals when we're having right. sex. That's important. That's an mm-hmm. important, important thing to think about. Yep. Well. So you can do that when you're not having sex too. When you just have a boner, you know, you're saying before, like, what do I do? I have this boner. I need to blow my load. The same thing you just said works during sex. So I don't have to say it because that's it. But when you're just a regular dude with a boner and you're wondering like, what are we going to do? Like I'm losing my mind because it's like, I got to blow this load. And every girl I look past, I want to go grab her ass. And oh, I'm just going to look at some porn, but you can do exactly what you just said was, which is draw the attention away from your dick and then circulate it. You could just breathe it, breathe through it, circulate. And before you know it, you know what ends up happening? At least for me, I start feeling like rain dropping down on my face. <laughs> I almost feel like the orgasm feeling it 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 moves from its consolidated place between my legs to like throughout my body like i start feeling like a, like a, a, what one author in another book called energy Carreza, a really good book i can't remember the author calls it he calls it a valley orgasm a valley orgasm isn't a peak orgasm peak orgasm is like we're pushing we're pushing for the for the ejaculation mm-hmm. valley orgasm is where you just breathe and enjoy your boner but let it spread through your body. Mm-hmm. No, it makes sense. So you could literally just sit here. I could sit here, have a boner, and like be kind of having a little bit of an orgasm because I'm spreading the energy by breathing. Absolutely. We don't think about that enough when we're having sex because sex is a very mechanical thing in today's culture. We look at it, it's all just mechanical. We don't think about the the mental or spiritual aspects of sex. So we talked a little bit about, <clears throat> I don't know, I guess that is more physical too, though, because you're breathing, you're putting that energy in other parts of your body. What about just handling mm-hmm. handling our sexual urges in a mental way? You know, like, like especially men that are working out, they're eating right, they have high testosterone levels because they're mad. You know, when I, since I started eating really well, I started training and I have this more masculine mindset. I've been diving into these ideas. Like my sex drive is more stronger than it's ever been and that can be a a detriment you say you're working out at the gym like oh you're checking out that chick's ass over here you're you're on your instagram and this shit's being thrown at us from all angles where you don't even have to be following these girls but you'll be scrolling on your instagram and do you ever see that reel that always comes up in the top right it's always a chick like on the home page there's always a chick shaking her ass on TikTok, or they have these reels. What you could do is you go in there, you click that, and there's a button you could click that says "Show less of the." Yeah, of these. yeah. I'll have to They'll do. They'll go that. away. You have to do it, and that's a part of my answer to your question: is that this is going to sound like a weird idea, but if you follow it, if you're in any conservative, uh, conservative religion, religious uh, circle, they'll tell you that it is incumbent upon us to turn our eyes away. You got to control your eyes first. The battle for your soul is like you even said, mental. It's in your head. The battle for our souls happens up here. What happens down here is not, I'm not a slave to my body, except if I let my mind then latch on. And then the slave is running the show. But this should be the master. The mind should be the master. And so how do you master the mind? See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Take your... 
take all those women on your Instagram and, and delete them, delete all those women from your Instagram. If you go in places, and this is one of the things where we, you know, you talked about, we both agree that men, it's incumbent upon us to have self-control. It really is. It's, it's our deal. It's a man's deal to have self-control. Uh, one of the things that you do as a man who has self-control is when you're walking around out in public and you see these thoughts dressed up with thongs up their butts, you turn your eye, you turn away. You got to turn away, especially if you see them coming, you got to turn away. I have, it's funny, the other, it was yesterday that happened, right? This happened to me and I'm just a man. I'm just a man. And I'm walking, I don't know, I think I was with my kids too. I was walking and this guy, he's walking towards me, older man. And he's obviously he's got his daughter with him, but his daughter's dressed real provocatively, right? I don't let, I don't let my daughters dress that way. But here he comes with daughter, you know, maybe a little bit older than my oldest daughter. She must be like maybe 19, 20 years old, whatever. She's walking over. And as I know she's coming because of course she caught my eye and I had to literally do this. I just turned my head away. So that number one, I'm not distracted. Number two, my children don't see me looking. My daughter sees me looking. That's gonna, that's gonna get some wheels turning in her head. And number three, I don't wanna give this woman the, the satisfaction of my attention because it's really what they're after. They're after the satisfaction of a man's attention. We literally, it's men's fault. We literally have to stop tolerating that shit because it's a distraction to us. This is why the Muslims cover their women from head to toe. Head to toe, these women, they got a veil over their face. You can't even see their their damn face. There's a reason why, because it's distracting to men and it throws us off our path. We can't focus. And any woman who says, oh, well, well, it's not their fault, like men should control their eyes. I agree, but let's have mutual respect for one another and stop dressing that way so that men can be the dignified, noble creatures that we've been designed to be. But instead, what we really need to do, because we live in this degenerate culture, is as men say, stop tolerating that. I don't tolerate that anymore. And just turn your head. Imagine every man started turning their head when women were dressed that way, they would stop dressing that way. Yeah, not to mention- You gotta turn away from the temptation. Not to mention, we love to complain about OnlyFans and the- why the widespread use of pornography and all these things and these girls on instagram that get validation from sharing uh you know pictures of their ass but we're the ones right. men, men are the ones that are creating that market so yes really like i'm not i'm not i do not subscribe to the uh uh women are degenerate and they're the they're the problem i says i subscribe to the idea that both men and women are the fucking problem and we're created by, by men, men not being strong, not having firm boundaries, not having a moral framework, not, sometimes you just got to say no, <laughs> men don't say no to women. That's one thing I've noticed. Right. And that's, what's causing right. all, all this shit. And, you know, everyone's going to have different opinions on this and whatnot, but we're in a spot where if men don't start manning up, this is going to, it, I don't see this getting any better. In the next decade, it's going to get far worse as the technology expands. Um, you, you, you said you hadn't, hadn't read uh, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, but in that book, he, this was written in the 1930s and he, he uh, predicted a lot of these things. And one of the things he had in here was, it was this, they, they called it feelies. So it was a movie, but it was, it was pornography that was attached to all your senses. And it, and it pretty much, it was like virtual reality porn, super realistic. I mean, if that technology is invented, fuck dude, there's going to be no, like families are going to be destroyed. There's going to be no, like, I just, I'm a little bit nihilistic about the future. I'm, I, I'm optimistic as well, but I just, I don't, I don't see us going in a positive direction and I don't know what the future is going to hold. And I, yeah, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. That's why we got to set ourselves apart. We have to set ourselves apart. It's not an easy thing to do because we're swimming in this shit, but by simply speaking, y'all, by simply having conversations with our family and the people that are closest to us and trying to set the record straight, trying to do things the right way, even in our own individual lives, I believe has an impact. 
I believe we do have an impact, even if it's just the impact of words and ideas right now, right? Like just the mere virtue of you having this podcast, you're putting a seed in certain men's head so that when the time is right, that seed can blossom into something that's, that's, that's worthwhile, right? He may get to a particular point where he needs to vet the right woman and he, he wants to get married because he wants to have children and hearing the things that you're talking about in your podcast, it, he will save him a whole lot of heartache. Where were our uncles? Where were our grandfathers? We never had any men to talk to us about men's things until the internet now. So it, gratitude for you and all the other guys who are speaking up so that men wake up and we can make a different decision about how we live our lives. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I started this podcast, not because I have all the answers because, but because I see a lack of communication. I see a lack of uh, platforms or outlets for men to have these conversations. And that's, that, that's the biggest thing, man. Um, before we wrap this up, there's one, there's one other uh, lane that I wanted to slide into. It's, you have, you have a video that's fairly recent, maybe the last few months where you discuss how you came into Catholicism and how at one point in your life, you were very, I, I related to this video. That's why I wanted to bring it up. You, you talked about how you dove into Eastern philosophy. You were listening to people like Alan Watts and Osho and you, 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 in the video, you explain that you like every time you would dive into a particular religion or religious idea, you would really dive in and really live it and see what value you could get out of it. What, what took you away from Eastern philosophy? Maybe took away is not the right word. Maybe uh, what shifted your mindset from the more Eastern thinking to uh, the Western religion of Catholicism? I'm just curious about that journey more masculine thinking. My, I, I became a big boy. Those religions are for, for effeminate baby boys because there's no boundaries. Any, and this is just, this is my opinion, but any religion that's a religion about do whatever you want, as long as you feel good. And it's all about me and my narcissistic attachment to reaching some sort of nirvana. And it's, it's me, 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 I'm my own God. This is another one, like you're a God, right? All that did for me, as a youth studying that stuff was make me prideful, uh, narcissistic, and what's the opposite of humility? Pride. All I did was feed my ego. That's all it was, it was ego feeding uh, uh, philosophy. And it's, it's interesting because it's all about feeling good. The whole thing is like, it's about feeling good. There's very little boundaries and responsibilities. And I got to a particular point in my life when I began to see myself as I was, and I realized that I was being a blue-pilled, effeminate, faggy boy, and I needed some boundaries in my life, like I knew when I had a strong father growing up. Well, of course, you know, I leave my parents home, and I think I know better. Yeah. And so, among many of the reasons, there's there, it was such a there's so many different angles at which I could approach this. One of the main things that really I brought me back to Catholicism because I was, I was uh, baptized as a kid that the, that, the, that the Protestant religions could not do because Protestantism is purely about do what you want. It really is. It, the whole concept of Protestantism is to protest the authority, which means yeah. I'm not doing what you tell me to do. And, if you, and nowadays the, the faith is so fractured that you could pop into any Protestant church and they're just making up their own stuff. We worship like this. We believe the Bible says this. We're making up our own definitions. Again, what's that? what is that? Chaos. Effeminacy is chaos. We know that women represent chaos, men represent order. It's just, it's just the duality of nature, David Dita. So it was more chaos. Religion was just offering me more chaos. Uh, it didn't help me get more squared in and boundary yeah i really by the grace of god i was brought to a place where i i knew i needed to repent and i know i i wanted to confess my sins and i was lucky enough to have been uh initiated into a church that gave me that op option even though i hadn't been there for like 27 years and so i walked into a catholic church and i started practicing the rituals and the forms, the rituals, uh, and the boundaries associated with thereof gave me, at least just for me, a stable framework for now for, to, to launch into the second phase of my life where I take my role as a man that much more seriously. 
Yeah, I totally agree with all of that, especially when you, I was thinking, thinking about, I wanted to ask you that today. And I was thinking about that this morning, Eastern philosophy is all, it's all about detachment. That's how you reach enlightenment. It's, right. deta it's detaching from life, which is almost like a spiritual nihilism. It's a, uh, you're just, I'm just going to sit here, bro. Everything's all good. And that's why a lot of countries that are Eastern minded, they don't have the same progression that Western countries have had because it's very relaxed. And during that time that I was into that stuff in my personal life, I was smoking it. I don't do any drugs anymore, but at that point I was smoking a ton of weed. I was doing psychedelics, which I thought were showing, <laughs> showing me God. I don't know if you have any experience with that. But I was go going through all. <laughs> yeah, oh, I was, yeah, I thought the same way. Yeah, I felt like I was in there. I was, I was reaching that point. I felt like I was talking to God, all this stuff. <laughs> and then when I finally got, I finally got humbled by a really bad trip on psilocybin, just knocked the fucking shit out of me. And I was like, wow. And I, I, some shit happened. I went through a rough breakup. And I, I thought I had all these answers in life, but I found myself at rock bottom feeling nihilistic as fuck. And I'm like, dude, every that entire path I was going down that felt so right and so connected and so enlightened was it was complete fluff. It had no substance. I was weak. <laughs> I was yeah, dude, I felt like absolute yeah. shit. And then when I started being started uh uh I would say Jordan Peterson's lectures made me start seeing wow, western religion. Jesus took up his cross. He and he didn't detach. He embraced the suffering and, you know, he did his, he, he, uh, sh pursued his purpose, his fulfillment, which was, he had to suffer to do that. And that, that was the whole idea. It's, it's, it's that, that right there is the biggest difference between those two philosophies. And I'm not shitting on people that subscribe to Eastern philosophy or anything like that. It's just for me personally. Yeah. The math, it's much more, it's much more Western philosophy is a much more masculine framework to be subscribed. Yeah. To. yeah. Patriarchal. Awesome, man. Yeah. That was a great conversation. Um, before we, before we end today, I would, is there anywhere, where would you prefer people finding you on online? Where can people find you online, I should say? If you want to hear me talk about the things we're chatting about, just go to my Elliot Hulse YouTube channel. Awesome, man. Thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, I respect what you do, and you are uh, paving the way and sh sharing things that are uncomfortable to share in this world. So I appreciate what you're doing, man. You got it, man. We're all in the same boat, going the same place right now. It's just like a global awakening, man. It's good to have you on the path.